welcome to the Aiki Dojo podcast. I am David Ito, Chief Instructor of the Aikido Center of Los Angeles. And we have a special guest today, Didier Boya Shihan. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, especially after the pandemic, right? We're yeah. all happy to be still here. Back in, uh, not business, but back in activity. Mm. But then the pandemic, like, pwak, 75% of the students have disappeared. I, I'm sure, you know, it killed a lot of dojos. We 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 this did okay. Is a good thing. Yeah, we did. Well, yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we. Now maybe we'll have more quality because there is less quantity. So you started Aikido in 1971. About uh, I can't remember. It was 71 or 72. Mm. I had had some problem with the the military business in France because it was mandatory at the time, and I was on the run. Oh, really? I was not doing it, so I got caught. So they arrested me in uh, Africa, where I was running. They, they caught up with you in Africa? Yeah. And so I had to do some special uh, commando shit, you know, so <laughs> sorry for the French. Uh, otherwise, it I would be court martialed. And so when I arrived back in, uh, in France uh, after this uh, year and a half in the uh, parachutist corps, I was sick with malaria, I was very weak, and I was a bit in distress. And one evening, uh, I got this new, new job, so I was new in a small town, trying to go to the movies, and the theaters were uh, on hold, they were not playing that night. So I went to a cafe, and there was a small television, and they were showing Aikido. Oh, yeah? And I had no idea what it was, and I had a shock. So uh, the next day, I, I did a little research in the city, and I found a dojo. Hmm. And then, uh, how old were you when you first started? Uh, I was born in '46, so I was uh, about 25 or something like that. No, that's 25, 26. About that right age in the 20s. But I was not athletic at all. You know, I was weak and uh, sick with this malaria stuff. Yeah, it's kind of like yeah. Osensei and Tohei Sensei's. Uh, story, right? Yeah, they be be <laughs> begin uh, st starting with being sick and then yeah. building themselves up with Aikido. Yeah, That's interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then what uh, What year did you get uh, Shodan? From Tamura Sensei. Because at that time, uh, uh, he was the only uh, teacher uh, in France that had a big group. Uh, so uh, the dojo where I started was, of course, affiliated to uh, Tamura Sensei's group. And uh, so I got to know him and I started to go to seminars and classes. How often did you see Tomura Sensei? About two times a month because he, oh. he didn't have a dojo at that time. He was, um, he was, salary, he was on a salary from the, the group, from mm -hmm. the federation. And so he, he, he was required to go every week, every weekend, Saturday, Sunday, to some place uh, local in France, so from north to south, north to south, east to west. So it, pretty much it was twice a, a month. He was in a you know re reachable area, either by car or by train. What was Tamura Sensei like? Ah, he was great. He was uh, uh, very dynamic, short, you know, uh, oh, light. Yeah, he's a short man. Very very um, energetic. Mm. So it was it was wonderful practicing with him. I even found recently a video on the, on the internet in a seminar nearby where I was living, 1974, where this is, is teaching and he used me for okay, and I'm terrible because that was, that was hardly beginning. And I said, wow, he was using me already. So it was fun. It was it was interesting person. He and then like I think I read on your in, in your blog that Tumor Sensei one time um, told a funny story about he. A person came to challenge Osensei, mm. and then Osensei said, Tumur Sensei, go up with a sword. Yes. And then the guy went to attack uh, attack Tumur Sensei, and then tripped, he on, tripped his on his hakama, and he fell <laughs> over, and the, the sword rolled. But the funny part of the story is that Tumur Sensei was saying he was terrified. Yeah. Because he had this guy with a knife blade, you know, who seemed a little bit of a loony, attacking him, you know, and shouting with a big squire. Oh! and then fell over. And, and by the time the guy was on his feet, 
Osensi had disappeared already. You know, he had seen enough of this clown ring. And he was telling that. That would be very embarrassing to have this. I mean, you don't, you're like, just go, oh, I'll just oh, go home. Imagine, yeah. <laughs> But did you did you did you ever see any uh, yabure any of the challenges? No. Well, I saw the result of it mm. uh, a, a couple of times. Uh, people would sign a form downstairs that uh, they you know uh, release hombu of all the consequences, <laughs> and then whoever was available to do it. So at that time we were having private lessons, Chiba Sensei, in, in hombu, on the first floor, the small dojo on mm. top on the top. So a couple of times. Uh, Chiba Sensei stopped the class and said, I've got something to do. Can you go change? So we would go down to the uh, locker, the changing room. But of course, we knew that something was going on. So we would sneak in opening the, the curtain. And I saw these guys coming up down the fourth floor with a bloody uh, handkerchief and, on their face. Wow, that's that's crazy. That, But I mean, I do you know of any other challenges that... A couple, but at that time they were not. It was not frequent. No. After these are the the, the the late seventies. So yeah, that's like a fifties and sixties thing trying to and trying before, to eat. Yeah. And before in uh, the Kobukan Dojo, yeah, apparently mm. it was quite frequent. And then what year did you go to Homo Dojo? Seventy-seven. So six years, six or so years after you started Aikido. Did About you, yeah. Did you speak Japanese before? No, very little. So you walked in and. Like, hey, much, I don't... Uh, well, I knew two people that were living in, in Japan. There was uh, uh, a woman from uh, Venezuela, hmm. Margaret Marcano was her name. And she was, at that time, she was a student of Chiba Sensei. She was living in Switzerland and she was following him, following him in England and all over Europe. And then when he moved back to Japan, she went to Japan too. Oh, wow. What, what, what was that culture shock like? None. Like? You, what, no, would you walk in? I just walk in and I loved it at first sight. Wow. Yeah, I was, I was immediately said, yeah, that's the place where I should be. It was perfect. And my first partner on the mat was Shibata. And Shibata sensei killed me. He beat the hell out of me. <laughs> I had blood everywhere. And I was saved by Shibata sensei who came over and said, slow down, he's just arrived. Give him a chance. Uh, Yoshida Sensei had the exact same yeah, thing. That was the law pretty much there. Yeah, when they, you were new, somebody would beat you up. <laughs> that's old school. They don't do that yeah. anymore. Uh, I don't think they do no, that No, but because the dishes are not as vindicative that they were at that time. Hmm. And Miyamoto was, was a beast also. Yeah, yeah that's what uh, Yoshida Sensei was saying. But that was his job. So. The dojo enforcer type thing? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. And that, that was, you only knew those two people when you came to uh, Japan? Yeah, the other one was a, a French guy who I knew from France and uh, I knew that he was, he was living near the dojo. So they gave me a hand. Both of them gave me a sort of a, a hand. And within two weeks, I'd, I'd found a room in the, at my own place. And then you, what were those private classes like that you took with Chiba Sensei? The, uh, when Chiba Sensei came back from England and, and went back to Hombu to uh, uh, take care of the new International Aikido Federation, uh, he had no class to teach at Hombu. And Osawa Sensei's father uh, mm. uh, gave him his class a Friday night at 5.30, just before the, the Toshu's class. Mm. So he had uh, this slot. That's the only class he had, one hour a week. And the, the, the group of American and English that were uh, around Chiba Sensei decided that it was not enough. They wanted more. So you always had the possibility at Hombu to require private uh, instruction. You would pay not a big fee, actually. And you would uh, create a group of six, seven people, eight people the most. And we had these private uh, lessons on the, the fourth floor. What kind of stuff did he teach you? Well. For instance, he took that famous uh, Budo Lenshu uh -huh. and we went through it from page one to page whatever. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, that must have been very interesting. Yeah, extremely interesting. So he, he, was, he had the book with him in, uh, in uh, and the church dojo table. and then we would go from one thing to the other. We did it all. How and try to figure out how, you know, from the explanation that they were there, uh, how to manage it. You know. 
Wow, that must have been really yeah, interesting. interesting. Like, especially with uh, Chiba Sensei's point of view, mm. because he's closer to O Sensei in that generation, and so any of those things he might be. Oh, I remember that one little thing that. Yes and no, because this uh, Budo Ren Shu is from uh, 1938, if I'm not mm. mistaken. So it's really before, you know, Doshu was not doing this at all. Yeah, they don't do that at all. No. I mean, that's... So it was sort of a, well, uh, since Osensei is not here anymore to tell us, but we have that book, you know, the, the drawings and the explanations on the side. How long did it take you to go through the whole book? About a year. Uh -huh. But Bruce Bookman remembers that clearly too. Yeah. He talks about it. And, and I'm sure that that uh, Aikido is much different than the Aikido you were practicing at Hombu Dojo, and then it's much different than the Aikido today. You, you once again, yes and no. It's close. Yeah. It's close. And it depends how you, you, you read it. You know, uh, nowadays, like if you do Shihonage, you will, you will give way. To your partner to take proper right. me right. so that it doesn't hurt his elbows. At that time, they didn't really care. <laughs> they would just go, and it's your problem to take with me. It's not theirs. Did you ever take uh, in those in that class for that thing? Did you ever take Chiba Sensei's Ukemi for that? Oh yeah, yeah. How did that feel? In the uh, in the private class, everybody took Ukemi. You know? And then in in his regular class as well, the group uh, private lesson group was first to take Ukemi, even before GDC. But how did that feel to take his shihonage ukemi? You like had that? to be on time. Yeah, uh, you have to be really on time. Otherwise, you it, it wouldn't break you, but it would hurt. Wow, that's I mean. So it's, it was really good uh, a good school to learn uh, to take ukemi. Well, what was your favorite technique out of all those techniques they did? Oh, I didn't mind any. Uh, I hated iriminage because he would hit you with the arm, mm -hmm. you know? and if you were not really on time, if your timing was wrong, then you would get hit bad. Ikkyo was easy. You know, Nikyo, I remember once having to take a Nikyo uh, technique for about half an hour with him. Suari was on. Nikyo. I couldn't eat for a week because my movies became like this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, can't really... I couldn't move. Do, he was strong, yeah. Do you, do you see a difference between uh, Chiba Sensei when he was at Humbo Dojo then and then later on in life? Yes, very much because he, uh, we talked about it with John yesterday. We were not his students in Hombu Dojo. We were Doshu students. Right. So that was the status, you know, and he was, he was helping Doshu to teach classes. But when he was back in America, when he, he opened his first Dojo and then until even in, uh, on Adams Avenue, the fourth Dojo, he was on his own. So the guys there were his students, mm. the Dishis, and they signed up, you know, so they would give him any, all liberty to do whatever he wanted to do to them. But was his Aikido um, stronger, softer? I would say pretentiously that it was better. Oh. It was getting better, better, and better, and better. He was really studying. You know, he was not. He was never sitting on his knowledge. When he entered the dojo, basically his attitude was, "I don't know nothing. Now I'm going to practice this to get better on this or on that." That was mm. it, what he was doing. So, what, what year did you leave Japan? What year? Yeah, uh, two thousand sixteen. Oh, so you stayed. You stayed a long time. Yeah, forty so years. You're, you're, you might as well just be Japanese. Forty years. Yeah. Yeah. I'm more Japanese than <laughs> many of them. <laughs> where, where did you learn to speak English? Um, where? I, I mean, don't know. Actually, just immersed France, into France, English, American, France, the Beatles song, uh, films, mm -hmm. and at school uh, we. Of course, in high school, you learn a little bit of English. And it's not a difficult language to learn. No. Yeah. I'm still trying to work on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but especially in Europe. You, know, you can learn easily Italian, Spanish. And then if you speak English, it's not too difficult to learn German uh, and so on. Wow, that's really that's interesting. You know, like I, I've admired you from afar for a while. Because you're one of these people that people dream of living your life. They all want to go to Japan, learn Japanese, study with uh, Doshu, study with Chiba Sensei, study with Mitsuzuka Sensei. So I mean, like you, you live like this dream life for people. I was lucky. Yeah, I, I got there at the right time, and everything. At first, it was a little bit difficult because 
it was rough to get you know work and enough money to survive but in the beginning i didn't really need money very little mm. you know once you paid your fee at hombu in mitsuzuka sensei and my rent was ridiculously low you know, I had a room, that's it, you know? So it was like $160 a month. How, how often did you train? Every day, five hours. Really? Yeah, I did all the classes. Would that, can, would that make you a, a, a student of, Hon of Hombu Dojo? You are or a member. A member. Of, of Hombu Dojo. You will never be a deshi. They never had foreign deshi. Yeah. And I didn't want to be. So it was better for me to go because I didn't have any, you know, uh, strings attachment yeah. to do chores or anything like that with Hombu. I would pay my fee, attend the class, have a good relationship with all the teachers, and go out at night with them, mm -hmm. you know, drink and you know, eat. Because that's like the golden age of Aikido. In a way, a uh, post-war. Yeah, post-war. Post I mean, like... Because everybody was still alive. Yeah. You know? Yamaguchi, but I mean, the... Osawa, Yamaguchi, Arikawa, Arikawa, Watanabe, Masuda, mm -hmm. everybody was alive. But I mean, that, that, so that, and then you also studied with uh, Takeshi Mitsuzuka Sensei. Yes, the, the, uh, Mitsuzuka Sensei, I met him, uh, I was, I'd love to do Yaido. Mm. And uh, Ch uh, Tamura Sensei was teaching always a little bit of Yaido, basic stuff. And one year in 1977, actually, the summer, uh, one year after Chiba Sensei went back to Japan from England, he uh, asked Tamura Sensei to invite Mitsuzuka Sensei for seminars during the summer summer camps mm -hmm. and I got to sort of drive him around Mitsuzuka Sensei and his wife yeah and because at that time in, in between July and September there were a seminar two weeks long seminar one after the other that Tamura Sensei was teaching so starting early July and ending mid-September about so there were like five five big seminars following each other what what style did uh, Tamura Sensei do O sensei definitely and, and Doshu, because the Kishomaru Doshu was. Oh, no, I mean, uh, I mean uh, yeah, Yaido, that's yeah. Omori Ryu. Yeah. Omori Ryu. So, oh, okay. Uh, Nakayama Hakudo mm. sensei. Because I don't hear it's all Jikiden and Eishin Ryu. Uh, it's nice to Eishin Ryu. Right? Uh, Seite Gata. Yeah. Seite is less interesting because it's come from, it's a mixture of a lot of uh, things and it's been. Every time you have a new uh, president, they change something. So once your, your foot must be like that, the next day it's like this, and then like two bullshit stuff, <laughs> you know? But Asian view is very nice. Sword is you take the sword without cutting all your fingers out, cut, clean the sword, and put it back. And that's, that's the end of it. <laughs> and then you imagine all the different ways you have to draw the sword and cut. Yeah according to where your supposed enemy are coming. Mm -hmm. That's all there is. And then you can create your own school. Who cares? Like that's, the... that's what it is, you know, all these schools. And Mitsuzuka Sensei had studied with Dakayama for a short time Yeah, at the end of his life. So he came to France and I got to, to drive him around and we, and we became, you know, acquainted, although he didn't speak a word of French or English and I didn't speak Japanese at all. But he was so nice and he was such a good teacher. Then I said, well, I have to go. To Japan. So when he left mid September, I told him, Well, I'll see you in Japan in a short time. What, what year was that? 1977. Oh. oh, so you started Aikido and Yaido at the same time in, well, in Japan? Yeah. Uh, I, when, when I went seriously? Yes. Yeah. And Yaido was heavy. How, how, how many days a week did you do Yaido? It was Wednesday night, two hours. And then Saturday from one o'clock was open. So it could be six, seven hours. Night. Yeah, so five, six, six hours in a row. And then whenever he just decided to stop. Yeah, when, uh, and then Sunday the same, one to whenever it stops. And Sensei usually was sit, was sitting on, on the corner somewhere in the dojo with his pack of cigarette <laughs> and his cup of tea. And, old, old school and, style. And that was all. And he didn't even look at what was going on. Mm. When I, when I, my brother was little, he studied kendo. The, the sensei did the same thing, just sitting on, at, by the door smoking a cigarette while everyone's doing kendo. And the first day, I knew him, so I knew, I knew Mitsuzuka sensei back in Europe, shortly, just a couple of months now. But when I went to Japan, I asked formally Chiba sensei if he knew a teacher where I could do yaido. Uh, he said, yeah, well, I know the best. So uh, 
I said, you, uh, would you introduce me to that teacher? And he said, sure. So we went to see Mrs. Gazante. And I had, I had to say, say that, and Chibasante uh, formally introduced me and asked Mrs. Gazante if he would take me as a student. The old way. Yeah, you know? that's the old way. I'll do that but there was a commitment, oh, yeah. especially with Chibasante. Did you use a mojito or? Uh, uh, in the beginning, yes, but very quickly I wanted to get a, a sword, so I had a blade very quickly. Hmm. Not too good to start with, but then you know I kept buying new blades. And so do you, do you still have a lot of your swords? I've got about six or seven of them, but uh, the two or three katanas and the mojizashi stone too. Yeah, because doing uh, yaido with a shinken is. Uh, much more serious than a mojito. Yeah, well, you can't, I mean, it's, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't, there is no sense in doing yaido with something that doesn't cut, mm -hmm. right? Because otherwise there is no danger. So. Did, did you ever see anyone cut themselves in she class? Doesn't see, <laughs> she doesn't see a couple of times, bad. And the yeah, hand? Uh, the, the arm, you know, pop. Oh. All, 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 all of it. And yeah, friends also uh, in the dojo. Uh, that being careful and and you know this bleeds a lot so it's, it's not bad because it's on your meat so yeah uh, you fix it <laughs> but it bleeds a lot so it's impressive do you ever cut yourself no never you're careful no but it's just uh, you're concentrated that's why you, when you have a, a blade you know, a live blade you you are really concentrated into what you're doing because it's always two ways this mm. thing on the katana cuts but it cuts you too no. What, what was uh, Mitsuzuka Sensei like? He was old school, mm -hmm. uh, very nice person. After class, we always go to his place. He had a tiny apartment the size of your office there. And we would stop by the supermarket, buy a lot of stuff. And then Mrs. Mitsuzuka would cook the stuff and we would drink. <laughs> and he liked whiskey and bad whiskey on top of it. Oh. <laughs> 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 it was really bad. And then Chiba Sensei told us also that when he opens a bottle, you have to drink it all. Yeah, oh, all he, of it. He, and, he, don't, and drink twice as much as he does so he doesn't get sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, I don't drink, so that would be hard for me. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. It's a strange world if you don't drink. Yeah. Yes. I'm told that when yeah. I go there and my cousins say, yeah. you're, not, you're not an interesting person because you don't drink. You drink all the time. Yeah. Do you still have that in your own lifestyle? Uh, I drink less than I did, but yeah, I like to drink. Mm -hmm. And I like in the evening when everything is finished, then we're going to talk together. We're going to have conversation and it's nice to have, you know, a good bottle of sake or whiskey. Mm -hmm. Good this time, good sake or good whiskey. <laughs> so, you know, you kind of immerse yourself into Aikido. It's kind of like the same way you immerse yourself in the language, Japanese, English, you know, that you kind of... Mm -hmm. The you, language was more of a necessity yeah. to survive. But I mean, you didn't like take a formalized course in Japanese, a formalized course in, in English. You kind of, just like your Aikido and your Yaido, you just jumped right in. It's the same, no? It's yeah. practice. Yeah, so it's... I, I went to school, the Japanese school, for about six months. Mm. But I didn't have time to spend in language. And my plan was not to stay for so long at first. Oh, really? You were only going to stay for... I just wanted to stay for a couple of years. And because I didn't know how it would work for money wise, if I could get a job or if I could stay, because there were visa problems as well. Uh, and then when you were there, did you teach Aikido uh, for money? No, no, no. But you had to have a job. Yeah. Somehow. So I was doing translation with the English, French, French, English translation, uh, which was good because I could work my pace, you know, night or between classes. And I didn't need that much money, so that was okay. As soon as I got enough, you know, I could do, do my lessons. But for foreigners that were studying Aikido, that was the main problem, how to survive. Yeah, I imagine, unless you're rich. Yeah, where well, there was no uh, nobody like that, yeah. that I know. I knew a few in, in Europe, yeah, the American actually. Who were um, and this girl from Venezuela who didn't need to work. They, they so a, f a couple of Americans who were, are filthy rich by uh, heritage. Mm -hmm. They they don't need to work, so they can study something. That must be nice. Yeah, it, it, I guess. <laughs> 
But you know, so you, you've seen a lot of famous, now famous Aikido teachers that at that time probably weren't that famous, you know, but now they became famous. They were in Japan. Yeah. You know, uh, or the Yamaguchi Sensei, Harikawa, mm. Osawa, the father. Yeah, Kisaburo. Mm -hmm. They were famous. And Hombu Dojo, is, you know, has always been famous yeah. in Japan. It's a big thing. It's a foundation. It's protected. It's well protected by mm -hmm. politicians, and businessmen. Uh, whose class did you like to go to the most? Uh, since I, I just told you, I was going to every class, but I had a preference for Yamaguchi Sensei and Masuda Sensei. Mm. And then Shibata Sensei was teaching a uh, Wednesday afternoon. A three o'clock class was great because there was nobody. <laughs> there were maybe eight or ten students, so we, you you had you could practice with him all the time. You know? And of course, the private classes when Shibata Sensei was uh, still in Japan. Mm, that's I mean, that's what people dream about. They dream of taking those classes or right, right, you know. being directly taught by Mitsuzuka Sensei. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I mean, but they don't. I'm not. Not that the Shihans today aren't the same level, we don't know, but it's they, we don't seem to have those same type of people. Mm, there are some young uh, blood, uh, either Japanese or coming from foreign countries, that seem very uh, eager to learn more. Mm. But I mean, the, that prolific teacher like a Yamaguchi or, mm. or Arikawa Sensei. Yeah, they're not there anymore. So, yeah. so I mean, do you, th do you think it's Aikido is? Like uh, Yoshida Sensei and I were talking a lot about how Aikido has really changed, and it's changed a lot in my thirty years. So I'm sure it's changed a lot yeah, in your time. Yeah. You know, how do you feel about the change in Aikido? What can you do? I mean, there's not much you can do because uh, the the way of training has changed, I believe. In what way? It it got weaker, hmm. uh, and it's not as intense as, as it used to be. It's diluted. Yeah. You know, it dilutes with the numbers. The more people are doing it, the less quality you get. Yeah, like for instance, you used to say that um, you, once you let everyone wade in in the shallow end, no one will want to go into the deep end. Mm. And you go, sometimes that seems like it's true. Mm. You know that, but then as you get older, your your body feels that hard, intense training. Great, but if you've done the training when, when, when you were able to do it, then you won't feel that pain. Mm. Right? And then you don't need to do the intense training when you get older. Right. Because right. you're more in control, you can do less motion. But do you think it's because people, for lack of a better idea, are weaker? Or they don't need it? Yeah, yeah, they don't need you know, that. Who needs martial arts today except MMA to make a, a buck? And yeah. then you get destroyed and by age 32 you're in you know, a retirement home. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you, you, don't, you don't see uh, people that are passionate their whole life. You can't do basketball your whole life. Right. You, know, you can't be a football player your whole life. You have 10 years to make your, your, your money and then off you go. You know, but Aikido is not a sport. Yeah. It's not, there is no competition. So it's it's a discipline that you're going to practice until you die. You know, I've seen Yamaguchi know, Sensei die on the mat, basically. Yeah? Yeah, he was taken off to, in the hospital, to his house in, a, in an ambulance, and he never showed up after that. He died at his home. What was he? What, he, was te he was teaching class? Yeah. What was he teaching? I don't remember what technique he was teaching, but he was teaching the class, and he, he passed out. You know? and, and so they had to call an ambulance and take him away. I've seen a, an old man died on a mat, killed by Doshu. <laughs> to say he didn't kill him, of course, but Doshu did him. Every morning, this old man was there. And every morning, Doshu did his round. And when it came to him, he would do Ikkyo to him, gently take him to the mat. And one day, he didn't get up. So he was on the mat, you know, in this Ikkyo. Uh, and everybody started to look at, and he was dead. And wow. he had a big smile on his face. Oh yeah, yeah. Incredible. I mean, that's. I mean, that's the way you want to kind of go, right? Doing what yeah, you love. That sounds great to me. Yeah. The so things have really changed a lot in Aikido, and you trained yourself a certain way when you were younger. How do you train yourself today? It's more difficult. It's a completely different way of approaching uh, the training. I can't take Ukemi anymore because I've got back problem and knees problem. So it's not that I don't want to, it's uh, my body doesn't want. Mm. 
So if, if I'm to get thrown, uh, the body stops. So I have to find other ways to do that. But you don't have to take ukemi all your life. If you look at the teachers, all the great teachers, when they finish their uh, uh, apprenticeship years, they don't take ukemi anymore. But rarely. Yeah. I find that my now as I teach so many classes, I you go, oh man, I'm rusty because I haven't taught, I haven't taken a class in such a long time. Yeah, but you don't need it. Mm. Yeah, you, because you can do very very good training by teaching. If you get really involved in it, mm. it's equivalent to a good class. Uh, so how do, is it, do you think it's your mindset has changed? No, it's your yes about and, how you and, approach yes, training and the body as well. Mm. Yeah. You know, like you're not really thinking about how to smash someone eating the nugget. You maybe you're thinking about something else, and that yeah, more that's... control, more control of yourself and your uh, your partner. I think. Yeah, is that, did you find it? I don't know, Naskashi. That that. Yeah, you always want to be 25, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and, like and going, jump yeah, around and, and, and be in great shape. Yeah, definitely. And I loved it when I was doing it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you did it for a long, long yeah. time. And then there is one point where you start start to deteriorate. <laughs> the knees are gone, the surgery everywhere. Mm. And, and so you cannot do that anymore. It doesn't mean you don't train. That's that thing, you know, doing some of these things old school way intensely beats yeah. up your body. Yeah, uh, Mitsuzaka sensei couldn't walk in the, these last 10 years. Yeah, it's, it's such a hard thing to kind of like, it's not it's not a, a physical thing it's more a mental mindset thing mm. you know yeah, that definitely. one time i was at a seminar and afterwards i had dinner with the the teacher and she asked what was your what was your favorite what was the hardest technique and i said oh the class wasn't that hard mm. and she got upset and she said i said it's all mental that I, it's not getting upset you know calming myself down doing all those things that's harder than doing mm. the techniques mm. but people don't want to hear that right they want to mm. hear that the, the techniques were good but Techniques today don't seem to be as strong, you know. They, to me, they are irrelevant, but they are the necessary process to mm. uh, to train your your mental ability. But how do you train people today if they don't? You don't. Uh, uh, nobody never asked me if I wanted to train or Yamaguchi Sensei or Doshu, whoever was teaching at Hombu, didn't have any pedagogy. They yeah. would come and they would do a class, and uh, and that was it. You know, and you were training and you were learning that and your ambition was to become a nuke so that you can learn more from the teacher. Uh, but there was not an A, B, C, D thing or chapter one and section one. Yeah, that's, that's the old school way. But today's way is what is your curriculum? Like someone, someone uh, one of my students is teaching a, a three-year-old kid privately. And then they asked me, what, do, what should I do? And I said, well, you just play with them. Three years old. Yeah, but you shouldn't be in a dojo to start with. Three years old is ridiculous. But yeah. then the pa the parents said, "We want to see what your curriculum is, what the progressions oh, are." And yeah, I said, yeah. there's, there's no there, progression. "There are no progressions. They're three years old." Yes, but also with adults, there shouldn't be any progression. Yeah, it's their it's their responsibility to train. So, that's the old old school way. But like we have we put we publish a curriculum every month because people would. New people would join, and they would say, "I'm so lost. I don't know the names. I don't know anything. I don't. This is too hard." And they would quit. So we said, "Okay, let's fine. put the names on the fine. wall." This is fine with me. Quit. Yeah. Because if you're not motivated more than that, you know, if you're, I don't care what it's called. You know, the technique. Who, who cares? You know, but that's it, the modern person today cares. Yeah, but but forget it. Because if it's, that's the only thing you want to learn, then you don't do it. You do you do you do gymnastics. Mm. Uh, or uh, whatever you call it. But how do we, Aikido seems to be, for lack of a better term, broken today, right? That people, the, the stuff that people are calling Aikido isn't really Aikido. Maybe that's because of that. Yeah. So that, do you, or do you think it's because of, we gave them a progression so they think that they know? Too many dojos, too, too many, many bad quality teaching. Well, there's that's a that's a bad different story. Learning and bad learning. Bad quality teachers, like in your day, you know, they have high quality teachers experienced. Today they have low quality, low experienced teachers, and then he's a sensei, I'm a sensei. No no distinction between the two. Even in the old days, you know, it, it, even when the downgrade system didn't exist, six down should be the end of it. There shouldn't be anything over it. Because six down is when you're able to teach. Mm. You have some knowledge that you can share. 
So, end of it. Why seven, eight, nine, ten, then what? Eleven? Twelve? At this rate. Yeah, this is where we're going now. Yeah. So then you have your, you have Shihan 1, Shihan 2, <laughs> Shihan 3, she, you gotta go through all the Shihan. Shihan plus, Shihan 3 plus, yeah. Shihan 3 minus. Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And Shihan, what does that mean? It's, it's. Doesn't mean much. Well, it now. means that you're able to teach, that's all. Yeah. That's all it means. Like when you're in university or you have tenure, uh, this is what you, this is what Shihan is. Tenure in university. You're not anymore a professor, an assistant professor. You're not a professor. You're teaching professors. That's right. what Shihan is. Hmm. You're teaching the teachers. But if you sit on your on your on your throne because you're Shihan, you better go you know collect garbage because that's as as useful as that. Yeah. This is misunderstood too, right? Right. Yeah. Rank, titles, mm. status. Title, yeah. Well, sensei had a uh, strange way to decide who was going to teach and who was. And from what I read, the interviews of the uh, former deshis of the uh, before the war, the the training uh, period, hard training period, was pretty short. How how short? Two years, three years, yeah. four years really? top. You know? And then they were already assisting, teaching uh, here and there, or or leading dojos because. Well, sensei was had a network, a huge network of dojo, all over Japan. Mm. So he needed people to take care of this dojo. And but the question was, they were not sitting on their ass and say, "Okay, this is today. I'm going to do this. I'm going to." And they were practicing. They were, you know, trying to practice as hard as possible and get better. Mm. You know? So do you, do you think that it, the intense training period should be two, three, five it years? It should be, depends on the people. You know, some people are learning quickly, others it takes a longer time. But if you look in a system like Hombu, I'm, I'm not saying that it's the perfect system, but it works pretty well. And at least when Kishomaru Doshu was leading the thing, the deshi is at a two to four years uh, uh, uchideshi training period. Then after four years, they started already to teach in university clubs and the small thing. Hmm. And they, they grew up from that. And then they would teach the kids' class. Shibata Sensei was teaching the kid class. Oh, yeah? Kambu. And the kids loved it. And then he was teaching women you know, and beginners. And Miyamoto has done the beginners' class forever. Oh, you know? still? No, I think he doesn't do it anymore now, but for many, many years. And it was crowded. They loved them. Did you, did you ever Otomo for anyone? Uh, a couple of times for uh, Mitsuzuka Sensei, traveling to America. What was that like? He, he was an easy person. To, oh, yeah. to go. But you don't make mistakes. Because I won't make a mistake, man. I, I thought I would never survive that. I was supposed to pick him up in his house to go to visit Chiba Sensei in the country when he was living in the country. And we had too much drink the night before. And I did, didn't set up the alarm, uh, the clock. So I was woke up by the telephone. I was Mrs. Cassensi's wife. She said, where are you? Oh, shit. And then I said, I'm on my way. I'm on my way. And when I got to his house, he had locked himself in his room, in his bedroom, and he refused to come out. And I have to take him to Chibasan. They're waiting. You know, he has organized a seminar in Atake. So I had to get on my knees in front of this door and beg him for 30 minutes you know, to come out. He's going to kill me. Sensei, please come out. So finally, he came out, ignored me completely, and we walked to the station, took the train. And this is before all the telephone things, you know, so it's not easy to reach people. And when I, we arrive at the... At Hataki, we were a little bit late, of course. So she was saying, what happened? What happened? And I told him the story. He laughed. He asked off. He said, oh, you're in trouble. This is going to last months. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I was using a motorcycle at the time. And since I wasn't there, he was really, really concerned. He thought that I had an accident oh. with a motorcycle. So he was relieved that I didn't have an accident, but he was angry because I made him, you know, concerned. He was a good man. And 
Then one day when Chiba Sensei came to America in San Diego, he invited me to Zuka to teach. So I was the, the uh, Otomo. And we arrive in the San Diego airport and Chiba Sensei is not there. There is nobody. So I, I called the house and Kano, Chiba Sensei's daughter, answers and I said, Where is your dad? And he said, He's sleeping. And I said, He's supposed to be at the airport to pick us up. And he had, he had made a mistake with the time difference. He was expecting us the next day, but we were arriving before, mm -hmm. you know. With that. So I said, okay, no, everything's under control. I said to Mrs. Gasson, I said, okay, let's get, I get a car. Five minutes later, I went in the car. I have no idea where the house is. I've never <laughs> been to San Diego. There's no GPS. I don't know where it is. So I just get on the freeway <laughs> and Let's say I gotta get out of this freeway. Boom! I turn, I get off the I swear to God, I get off the freeway, up the hill, to make a right, it's right there. I went straight to the house without knowing where it was. But Chiba Sensei was like, Oh, here you are. <laughs> That's proper training comes yeah, out. I've, I've, I don't know what happened with some uh, deity was leading me and showing me the way. It was on 4th Street, still remember the name of the street, that's all.